Good morning, everyone, and welcome. I'm sorry, I'm a bit, uh, uh, yeah, I've got a cold like most other people in Christchurch at the moment, so I apologise. Um, this morning, I'm announcing the key elements of the proposal that I will be bringing to Council for consideration when we meet to adopt the 2015 2025, um, 2025 long term plan on June the 23rd this year. When we commenced the long-term planning process last year, it was the end of more than six months seeking to establish the true state of our finances as a council and what our options might be if we were to get our city back on its feet. Today's announcement is about ensuring that whoever steps up to serve the city in 2016 will inherit a credible and sustainable financial strategy that will stand the city in good stead for tackling all the challenges that still lie ahead. Having a favourable audit opinion is critical to achieving that. This means we cannot budget for income we might hope to receive, but be that from our insurer or from the government, but it's what we budget for has to be credible. It has to be credible. It can't be just what we might hope to receive. And we have been advised not to assume any further contributions from the Crown. That doesn't mean we won't be seeking additional support for particular earthquake related damage, but it does mean we cannot budget for it now. Our decision to focus this LTP on a base case, which we can adjust over the next year or two, has meant we have been able to satisfy the requirements of the Audit Office recognising that there are some unknowns that we cannot yet bank. Unfortunately, many of the submissions that we heard over the LTP process asked us to do just that, but we cannot. The previous Council did not have any audit discipline applied to their three-year plan and were able, for example, to describe the expected additional spend on the horizontal infrastructure as, quote, savings to be found, when they were not anticipating any such savings and in fact were expecting to spend more. Next year the Canterbury Earthquake Recovery Act expires and I want the city to be positioned to take full responsibility for leading the next phase of our city's recovery, including driving the regeneration of the central city and all the suburbs that have been so badly hit by the earthquakes, not least in the east of our city. Listening to those who submitted on the long-term plan, I know that this is what people want. Coming to terms with what has been lost has been very hard, but just as hard has been the sense of having no control over decisions that are being made for us. The number of submissions that focused on projects that the Council isn't responsible for was pretty overwhelming. But it highlighted the desire to have a real say about the city we are to become. We need to be in a position to step up and take a leadership position once more. The community outcomes that have guided long-term planning in Christchurch for many years capture the essence of our values as a city. A safe city, a city of inclusive and diverse communities, a city of people who value and protect the natural environment, a well-governed city, a prosperous city, a healthy city, a city for recreation, fun and creativity, a city of lifelong learning, an attractive and well-designed city. The earthquakes have not only reinforced the importance of these values, they have also reinforced the need for resilience in our infrastructure and within our communities. This is the goal we have set for this long-term plan, building resilience from recovery to regeneration. But there is even more than that happening as a result of the earthquakes. From disaster there can always come opportunity. The transitional movement that has enlivened spaces on a temporary basis throughout the city has captured the attention of the world. Lonely Planet and the New York Times say Christchurch is a great place to visit because of what is going on in these spaces. Christchurch is also becoming a place where anything is possible, a place that is open to new ideas, new people and new ways of doing things. This was reflected in the submissions on the long-term plan. Community after community came forward and said, don't do things for us, partner with us and we will do things for ourselves with your support. The arts community said, let's co-create. 
a strategy and work together on making this a vibrant city. Representatives of communities of disabled people said let's work together to ensure this is an accessible city. Business communities said let's make this a business friendly city. Residential communities from New Brighton, Littleton, Akaroa, Governors Bay, to name a few, said let's do it differently. Our communities are rich with ideas, talent and energy. Let's plan together and make it happen. Community leaders said we have networks that we can put at the city's disposal. Together we can tackle the wicked problems that challenge cities throughout the world. Homelessness, affordable housing, the impacts of climate change. People from all walks of life said we can help the city make good decisions today that will stand us in good stead for the future. Of course we heard submissions from those who opposed asset sales, but that wasn't a message we disagreed with. We all opposed selling community assets built up over years of public investment to bidders who are prepared to contribute nothing but cash to the community that invested in developing those assets. It's cold comfort when the benefit of the cash has disappeared. But freeing up capital from an asset base that has grown in value in order to facilitate investment in other areas, even if they don't generate revenue, like waterways, footpaths and streets, is a different story. And I don't accept that this applies to everything we own. I simply cannot see how car park buildings a facilities management company which does catering, a bus company and a construction and infrastructure company, all of which operate in competitive markets, can possibly be regarded in the same light as natural monopoly infrastructure companies such as our lines company, airport and seaport. I believe my proposal strikes the right balance between the two resounding messages we have heard from residents, getting the proposed rates increases down and retaining public ownership and control of our core infrastructure assets, the port, the airport and Orion. Under my proposal, they remain strategic assets and any sell down of their shares to strategic partners that directly benefit the city will trigger a special consultative procedure. I would much rather have that debate at that time. My proposal, however, directly challenges the view that the way to address the Council's financial challenges is to slow down progress and stop investing in the city's rebuild. Of course we must ensure every dollar we spend is spent wisely, but the last thing Christchurch needs now are more delays. Listening to those who live in the East and to those investors directly affected by the loss of momentum in the central city has left me without any doubt about that. Crucially, this budget is about taking back control and providing a platform towards self-determination for this city. But of course this is still a proposal, it is not set in stone. I have asked councillors to table their amendments by the 12th of June so that the parameters are clearly spelt out ahead of the debate on the 23rd of June. Our city's robust democratic processes, which unlike government cabinet meetings, are open to the public and live streamed for all to see, is what offers the transparency and accountability we all stood for, and why it is right that the city's interests in the recovery are best served by the council with the support of the government and not the other way around. The government will be releasing a transition recovery plan in early July, and I call upon everyone who submitted on the LTP to also submit to the government as a city, we have our own views of what the transition should look like, and we would like our communities to back us in the way the submissions have indicated they will. Finally, before taking questions on the plan, which is set out in the handout, I would like to make some additional points around our situation. Many submitters on the long-term plan suggested that the council organisation look at its level of expenditure, and in fact, the council had already tasked Carleen Edwards um, with doing just that. In response, she has established a comprehensive program of improvement for the organisation called Great for Christchurch that will not only improve the services the Council delivers, but will release $40 million of savings over the next three years. It will do this through scrutinising contracts and commercial arrangements, investing in modern technology to streamline customer processes such as online payments, and examining and improving the way that services are organised and delivered. 
This $40 million in savings is a very real and positive improvement to our short-term financial situation and there is more to come. On insurance, Council continues to engage with its insurer and reinsurers to get the best results for the city. Unfortunately, until a mutually acceptable position is reached or is determined by litigation, no clarity can be given on quantum or timing. I'm surprised that submitters found comments made by our insurer, with whom we are in dispute, even slightly credible. For the record, we continue to lodge claims on a timely basis, seek payments on assets where the quantum of loss has been agreed, refine our damage testing and continue providing reports to insurers, critique the insurer's repair methodology, continue negotiations and prepare clarifying legal proceedings to allow for the possibility that negotiations are unsuccessful. Our, on capital program, the original resolution asked the Chief Executive to look at ways to address the carry forwards which in this year was amounting to $700 million. This received a lot of comment and submissions. The Chief Executive has addressed this by reducing the overall amount and spreading it across the 10 years of the LTP. So the starting position is better than expected with an overall reduction of between 200 to $300 million over the 10 years. From the 1st of July, we will have in place an expert external group to assist a complete optimisation of our capital programme. An expert team is developing advice on capital release options, which will ensure that the Council is in the best position to make whatever decisions it needs to make. The advisors have no role in the decision making at all. Spreading the capital release over three years instead of the two years as proposed originally creates considerably more flexibility and satisfies the concerns of submitters on both sides of the asset sales debate that all options are canvassed before capital is released. In conclusion, I've given careful thought to the balance that is required in terms of rates increases, capital release and expenditure, while at the same time ensuring that we have time to address the underlying assumptions around the capital programme and operational spend. It is, I believe, a pragmatic and reasonable budget given the many constraints we're under and the demands of the many communities we represent. We still have a lot of work to do in what remains of our current term. This budget will provide the foundation for us to take back control of our city's destiny and to set a new direction, one which will bring the community back to the fore and allow us to determine how our city is rebuilt and repositioned for the opportunities and challenges ahead. And I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. So that handout, you see there's a bit of an outline of our proposal. Have you seen that already? It seems to me that originally the plan was to raise capital through uh, sales of shares in the port, the airport, and the riot. Are you pulling back from that now? What we're saying is, is that if at some stage, so in, in terms of the first year, that, that, that there is no need to look to um, that area, but if we were to go to that area, to um, any of our core infrastructure companies, which are natural monopolies, if we were to do that, then it would require or would trigger uh, what's called a special consultative procedure, which means that we would be able to go to the people of Christchurch with a specific proposal. And that very much came through the submissions process. People said, well, look, if you are going to sell down something, then really we ought to know what you're selling down. Um, the other assets we would take off the strategic assets list, which all that means is that it, it doesn't mean that the council doesn't get to make a decision on it. It still will make a decision. It just means that it doesn't trigger the special consultative procedure. So we've, we've really put a line in the sand between what we consider, or what I consider to be strategic. I mean, this is, this is my proposal that I'm putting forward to the council, um, putting a line between what is, what is truly strategic in terms of the interests of the city and uh, what is not strategic in that regard. So are you suggesting that those would be the first things that you would look to digest on? 
in terms of the non-strategic assets, yeah. we would certainly look at those. Now, some of them, obviously, for example, um, Lancaster Park comes off the strategic asset list under this proposal, uh, but there is no proposal to sell it at this stage. We are still in dispute with our insurer. So it is just a question of whether it is regarded, whether the ownership is regarded as truly strategic. And it's to focus our, intention, our attention as a council on what is strategic for the city and what is not strategic. Could you explain for me the uh, rates rises? What, when we originally came out with the consultation document, we proposed that there be um, rates increases of 8.75% in the next financial year, uh, followed by 8.5% in the following year and 8.5% the year after that. Um, we, we are reducing, well I'm proposing that we reduce the first year of that uh, to 7.93%, uh, which is 6% plus the 1.93%, which is the last year of the earthquake levy. Um, we're still working up on how that would then trend down from that point, but it will be trending down from that point. So that's going to be the starting point. We're still working up the final details, so we don't have a, a final picture of what that will look like yet. Why are you still working on that? because we are quite close to the final decision having, been, ha having to be made. We are referring um, the proposal that we have at this stage to the um, Office of the Auditor General on Monday, which, what, uh, which is why I thought it was important that we get something out today. But we are still, I mean, the, the, you know, it is, it is um, a fine balance that has to be achieved uh, between the combination of levers that we're having to pull. And uh, you know, depending on 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 how we release um, uh, how we release capital, for example, next year has an impact on uh, the return that we would normally get on dividends. So you know, all of these things have to be factored in. So there is an issue around next year, um, but we're expecting um, rates to fall below um, seven percent after that. What are you going to be? We, we will have that. We will have the final. We'll, we'll have a set of figures uh, to the um, Auditor General uh, by the, um, but well, by Monday. But um, as I say, we are down to the wire in terms of um, analysing some of the impacts of some of the decisions that we need to make. So that proposal, those proposed rates <coughs> rises after next year, that will be finalised today at some stage. Well, Monday. it's a proposal. Uh, the proposal will be that next year's increase is the 6% plus the 1.93%, which is 7.93% as opposed to the 875 uh, that was proposed at the beginning of the process. And in the following years, we're still working out the, we're still working out the final point, but it, it will be below 7%. And so the total rates rises, will it be lower than the original proposal? Yes. Yes. Can you have to say by how much? Not at this stage. Okay. And that's uh, possible because of? It is possible because we have um, managed to uh, um, re-look re at our capital spend and, um, and as I say, um, it, it's probably the next year's increase that, that will be the one that we will, um, we will be able to uh, fully confirm. We will review it again um, the second year's um, in the next annual plan. And I think I made this point right at the very start of this process that this is a base case and next year's annual planning process is going to be probably quite exceptional in the sense that it will be like a mini long-term plan process in that we are delving right into the capital programme and the related activity management plans and we will be looking at rates and um, the necessity for capital release and again those figures, um, I'm hoping, will continue to reduce. So when will we find out the, um, the final proposed um, rates increases beyond next year? Will that be any later today? Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure that we will be able to release that today, um, but it's, at, at, the, at this stage, the, the detail of the proposal um, 
is only as far as we can go. I mean, I'm hoping that we'll be in a position to um, provide those numbers to you on Monday. Do you think this is aggressive enough? I think that the way you're speaking has changed a lot since you first started talking about asset sales. You said that they were for a rainy day and a rainy day had come. Now you're backing off that. Well, no, I, I actually the... wasn't the one who said that. Um, I think others have talked about rainy days. Um, I've, I've never talked about assets in that regard. I've talked about um, I talked about um, the fund that we established. Uh, I can't remember the name of the fund. Um, the betterment fund. No, it was the it was the the capital endowment fund was the rainy day fund. But um, we're still receiving advice um, on on that, and it may be that that uh, that that's the kind of rainy day. Um, event that I was talking about, but no, um, assets are not are not um, that something that you you sell off because of a rainy day. Assets are something that you utilise the capital from um, in order to invest in what's a priority. And in our situation, we've got a city to get back on its feet, and it does require us. To to reprioritise what we're investing in, and that does mean that we have to look at our asset base. But that doesn't just mean um, selling shares in what we own. By pushing out the spread over 10 years though, does that prolong the financial agony of the situation? No, 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 no. We're only pushing out the um, capital release over three years. So what we've, what we've managed to do in terms of the carry forwards is actually look at that over 10 years rather than looking at it over um, one year. So what, what's, what's been happening is, is that we've essentially had um, a, a budget, a plan for what we're going to do in terms of capital expenditure, but we actually haven't borrowed or well, we haven't budgeted to borrow the amount that that capital expenditure would cost because we know we're not going to do it. That's stopped. So we've actually gone right into the capital expenditure. We've also had the benefit of the Horizontal Infrastructure Independent Review, which has enabled us to look at our assets, um, our underground assets, in a completely different light and, and factor the repairs and the renewals across a decade rather than just pushing it forward into the next year. So did I miss here when you said you were pushing the $700 million to spread over 10 years as opposed to a short period of time? This was the carry forwards. Okay. Yeah, the carry forwards had actually got to $700 million, which, I mean, you, you, can't, you can't say that you were, budget, you, were, you were planning to do $700 million worth of repairs in one year, so you'll just push it forward to the, end, to the next year. I mean, I think that a lot of people um, made submissions exactly on that point, that the amount of the, cap the, the carry forwards were unsustainable and no way could they ever have been um, delivered on. And so what the team has done is they have managed to spread the, the load, as it were, across the 10 years. So that doesn't put us behind the eight board. It actually means that we're managing far more sensibly the capital program that lies ahead. There will be more changes next year because bringing in an external group to assist us to go through that capital program and through the relevant activity management plans I think is going to make some substantial changes to the way that we operate. Is this going to be enough to pull the council out of a financial no sign? Yeah, I think it's going to be um, more than enough because it gives us the capacity to do what needs to be done. And, uh, and, and in many respects, some people have said, well, why would you leave the $350 million capital release in that third year? Because, of course, you may not need it. But my view is, is that, well, what is the land drainage recovery program going to uncover? You know, are we going to, you know, have sufficient to actually invest in what the city needs to get? back on its feet and that, that to me is why we have to leave that large amount in that last year. Um, it's not, it's not a, um, a, a fallback position but it just means that we are more than capable financially of seeing ourselves um, 
back into a position where this can be, you know, one of the greatest cities in the world. It's just an incredible sense of opportunity that we've got here. You talked a lot in your statement about reasserting leadership of the city. Is part of stepping back from selling off parts of core assets really, I, I guess, throwing that idea back at central government because they were very much in favour of that? No, I think that um, central government uh, has not has not really expressed a view um, directly, you know, in, in relation to in, in relation to this. I think that what central government's been looking to Christchurch to do is to is, is to pay its fair share, you know, and and we've expected that from the crown. Um, we will continue to talk to the crown about additional support, particularly around our land drainage because a lot of the issues that we are confronted with there are related directly to the earthquake. And um, so, so there will be further um, discussions to be had. But I think we have to accept that perhaps the previous um, three-year plan that we inherited didn't really let the people of Christchurch understand what the true financial position was. Um, and that's something that, you know, we spent some time finding out last year, and now we're in a position to address it. The numbers will change. The numbers will change next year. Um, I'm absolutely confident about that. Um, and I think that um, they'll, they'll change on the upside. You know, the, the savings that we set our chief executive to achieve in terms of operational expenditure were 2% a year. This is 7% this is a year. So she's gone well above um, what we asked her to, to achieve, and I think the people of Christchurch will be pleased to see that. Yeah. You obviously feel strongly about trying to obtain ownership of the port, the airport, and the right. Are you expecting any political flack from the right in regard to that? Because obviously some of the people on the right uh, would prefer sales and processes. I'm not saying that we have to retain 100% um, ownership of any one of them. What I am saying, though, is that they are strategic assets. They're truly strategic, and uh, nobody can expect to come here and just buy them because they have a value to our city that is far greater than uh, the, you know, the book value or, or, or the cash that you would receive for selling them. In my view, if a strategic partner were to bring benefit to the city and were able to grow the asset, um, then I would want to have that debate with the public rather than an asset sale versus not asset sale debate. I think that's a hiding to nothing. There is no such thing as a for or against when you're actually looking at something that strategic for the city. But you're more prepared to sell something like, say, city care. Um, for what reason? Why would you? Well, the, the point that I've been making, and, and, and this, is the, this is the debate I want us to have, is that what is strategic and what is not strategic. So um, there are aspects of what um, city care provide for our city, obviously in terms of um, uh, some of the contracts it has with the city, and some of the contracts that it has with other cities makes it strategic in that regard. But actually a lot of companies provide those services. So is the ownership of the organisation strategic? And that's the, that's the question that we need to ask and have answered. So I'd rather have a debate about what's strategic and what's not. Um, this actually lines that debate up very well. Then are you able to quantify the cuts to the um, capital program and how much you are proposing to put to things like New Brighton and the Flood Defence Fund? I haven't got the um, final details of that because we're still analysing um, the amounts that, that need to be allocated. Um, we've got um, obviously some, uh, some room to uh, provide some support for all of these, but these numbers are still being still being worked out. So are we talking about dozens of capital projects being deferred or are we talking about half? I mean what's kind of the scale of the... Well no, I, as I said to you, um, this is this is around the, the, the capital programme. Um, there, there's, 
there, there, for example, um, there, there are, I mean, I can't think of one off the top of my head, but, um, yeah, I, <laughs> I can't think of one off the top of my head. I'm looking for someone mm -hmm. for help. Um, I guess, I guess um, what I'm trying to sorry, find out I'm is, is what, is, what is being kind of sacrificed in order to... No, 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 it's not, it's not a question of sacrifice. It's a question of um, what doesn't have to be done now. Yeah, and so um, there are things that, that don't have to be done now. And so uh, one of the examples that, that I've used is the, um, the horizontal infrastructure. Um, the independent review has identified that there are things that don't have to be done now. So, you know, these things come off the programme. So that has um, allowed a little bit of extra to be freed up. And it has also allowed for us to um, address the proposed rates increase at the same time. So we may put up with perhaps shoddy roads for longer in order to free up some money. I think that there's, there's a, there are a number of things that we need to consider around the um, horizontal infrastructure, but I think I'll be um, announcing some detail about that next week. You've mentioned that um, the council isn't receiving any extra money from the government for horizontal infrastructure. I'm just saying that the, the Crown has certainly made it clear that we're, there is no expectation um, of additional additional financial contribution. Have they said why? No, I've just, I've just said, well, um, I'll be talking about the horizontal infrastructure um, review next week. Going back to the strategic assets, you said that a lot of people said that they wanted to have a say in what was allocated to by taking them off the list of strategic assets so that you don't have to go through this procedure, isn't it doing the opposite? So people don't get that chance to have their say? Which is why we've left um, Orion and the airport and the seaport on the strategic assets list. Aren't you still reducing people's chance to have their say about the other assets that may be sold? Them? Well, we, we did <coughs> consult. I mean, the, the consultation um, under the term plan uh, actually was the consultation that um, um, around all of these and when we talked to people about what was strategic and what was not um, Orion, Littleton Port and Christchurch International Airport came through clearly as strategic and there was less, um, less support for um, the others being regarded as strategic assets. So, I mean, not everyone agrees that they're not strategic, but um, there were a lot of people who, when asked, were certainly of the view that these weren't strategic as opposed to the other three. But people will still have this chance to have their say in the future if these ones off the list of strategic assets. It doesn't mean we won't consult, it just means we don't have to go through a special consultative procedure, which is a full amendment to the LTP. What, what might that look like with the No, I mean all, all it does is it means that we have to go through a special consultative yeah. procedure. It's only about Should there, yeah, it's only th yeah. it's only in relation to process. Okay. So um, I'll give you an example in, in Timaru, uh, the port ports of Tauranga um, made an approach about buying um, shareholding in, in ports of Timaru, uh, and uh, the um, special consultative procedure. Um, was invoked. I think there was a, a submission period of about a month and then the sale was approved. So uh, it's, it's just a process but what, what I've said is that I actually think that it's much better to have the um, it's much better to have the debate around those core assets in a special consultative procedure that looks at what is strategic about the approach uh, rather than simply having a I'm for or against asset sales because I think that doesn't really do justice to the issue and it doesn't do justice to the 
to the importance of those assets to our region. Does it mean though that the, the city sort of feel like remains in the market for strategic partners for those assets? Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Um, because, and it, this is what I kind of said right from the very start, that I didn't want it to be a debate about for or against asset sales. I actually wanted us to be able to discuss what would be in the best interest of the city. Um, and unfortunately, the, 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 the structure of the um, submissions process hasn't really enabled that to occur. And I guess it's because there's just been so much on the table and people have focused on yes or no. Mm. Um, and I mean, th th there were people who, who came to the council and said, yes, you should. But even they said, make sure you've done your homework mm. first and make sure that it's necessary and make sure that you've looked at all of the options, including your own expenditure, both capital and operational, before you make those decisions. More specifically, in terms of Essex, Lancaster Park, could you potentially sell it in the state that it is at the moment? I, I don't know. I'm just mm. saying it's not strategic. Mm. Ownership is not strategic. But we won't be selling it right now because we have an unsettled insurance claim on it. Well, this, that was the point of my question was, can you sell it? with the insurance claim still pending. No. <laughs> oh, unless somebody wants to well, inherit our insurance <laughs> claim, that might be that might be worthwhile. <laughs> is, is this process and this um, it's kind of like an accounting <coughs> job that, that you've done here. You've you kind of really really juggling the headings that things come under in order to kind of tidy up the the line of sight into what the financial situation is. But it, is it also still about proving to the Crown that the city's ready to take that control, being able to present a settled set of accounts that's um, you know, prudent and allows future options? Are you still proving yourself to the Crown so that this transition process happens in the I'd actually quite like to put it another way, which is that we're proving ourselves to, to the people who entrusted us to um, take up these roles um, at this time. And you know, when we when we stood, um, all of us were challenged, um, you know, with the enormity of the you know, problems that we would have to confront. Um, and all of us, I think, were um, less than happy with the extent of the problems that we found. Um, but all of us have remained 100% committed to finding solutions that are in the best interest of the city. But so it's really about... To prove it to the Crown? Well, the Crown has an interest. The Crown has an enormous interest in the future of the city. And they, as I say, will be producing a um, draft transition recovery plan in um, less than a month's time. And I think that uh, I would like them to have confidence that our city is ready to take back the role that we would previously have had um, at the time that our earthquakes um, you know, shook our world in more ways than one. Can you talk about what is known about what? is likely to be in that plan. Um, what has Sarah proposed as the agency responsible for putting up the draft? No, I think, I think that um, we've, we've gone ahead as a city to um, start to work up our own approach to how transition might work. And, uh, and we have been um, you know, presenting that view um, to Sarah. So we've certainly been feeding in our views about what what that should look like, and it it is more about um, the council taking um, take, taking responsibility for the um, really the regeneration of the of the city. So it's 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 not so much the you know the the, the government's anchor projects. It's it's more about you know the spaces in between. How do we get the city? 
um, back on its feet. But it's not just focused on the CBD, it's focused on our suburban areas as well, which have been um, pretty badly hit by the earthquakes.